Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord have mercy today to be found at S96. S96. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a reading from the letter to the Romans. You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come now, long expected Jesus, I invite you to stand and sing. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to his disciples privately about his coming. But about this day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, nor o- but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then the two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected time hour. Hear the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Advent is a season that starts at the end and moves toward the beginning. I know, it's a little confusing. What are we doing in the 24th chapter of Matthew and proclaiming all these things that are happening at the end of Matthew rather than starting at the beginning where we find Mary and Joseph and the town of Bethlehem and places like that? Well, it's just the way that the church fathers really wanted to orient or, or us to orient ourselves to what's about to come over the next three weeks after this one. Now, on Thursday night, or maybe it was Wednesday night, doesn't really matter, I watched an old movie with my family. It's called Chariots of Fire. It's a good one, folks. If you want to uplift, it's, it's kind of fun. And it's, you know, it's not three hours long like modern movies are. It's about two and change. But what was great about that movie is it starts with the death of one of the, one of the primary characters. His funeral is being celebrated. And then you go back. And you get to know why it was an important moment for everyone. So the beginning and the end of the movie are bookended by this funeral service. But what's most important is not, in some ways, the beginning or the ending. It's the life lived in between. And that's what I think the gospel writer of Matthew is trying to get at in this particular passage. And I think it's what the church fathers were trying to get at when they put it at the beginning of Advent. Yes, we need to contextualize what's about to happen. But then let's look at what's going on here. First of all, there was a great anticipation in the pe- among the people of God, the Jewish people, about restoration and renewal of life as they imagined it was when they got to live independently in Jerusalem and it was the address, home address for God, the temple. And they had not lived like that for years and years and years, even though they were a political subdivision of the Roman Empire and of Herod, they weren't independent. Herod served at the pleasure of the Roman Empire itself. One of his his claims to greatness was his ability to sort of manipulate Rome and keep himself independent, but the Jewish people weren't particularly fond of him. He didn't come from the line of David, and so they were anticipating with great hope when something would happen to restore all that they knew. In this particular gospel, Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry and he's trying to alert his disciples about that time when he would not be there and how they might need to live among the people of Rome in that time. And his command is this, stay awake, be alert, be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. Now, we've lived 2,000 years or so since even this was stated and said, and for those of us who, like me, or at least the 15-year-old me, was looking for that apocalyptic and eschatological moment when God would sort of come into the world and make things right, we're still sort of hanging on this moment as one of these interpretations of that end time. And it's true, there is some sense that the world will be culminated, but we don't know exactly what it will look like when we read this. All we know is that when the time comes, many things will be happening. And did happen to the disciples in many of their lifetimes. The city of Jerusalem was rezzed to the ground. The temple was torn down. And the people were left without that sense of God being among them. And I am certain when it happened, there was the sense that two were in the field and one was swept away either by the military forces or the leaving of the diaspora and leaving of Jerusalem 
and one was left because somehow he or she was able to eke out an existence and a living. The same was true for the women who were grinding their bread, that one was there and one was not. And for many of us who loved those tales of the end time, by the way, if you want to seduce me, give me a book about the end times. I'll sit and read it immediately. We often look upon this as, oh, this is a sign. But the sign here is, is kind of vague because what it says is people are going to be doing regular and normal things. Christmas shopping, going to the grocery store, and that Jesus will come among us like a thief in the night. We won't know it until it happens. So what do we do? Well, all Jesus can tell his disciples is what I said before. Be awake. Be alert. Being awake and being alert is supposed to be a constant state for a Christian. Now, I will tell everybody, I believe there is a moment of culmination that will happen and that God will impose his will. But I believe in the meantime, and consistent with the Gospel of Matthew, there are other moments when we can have Jesus break through in our lives that will happen even here and now in the everyday moments of our existence. When we go back into the Gospel of Matthew, and once we start moving forward once again instead of backward, we're going to read about the Beatitudes one of the most famous parts of the Gospel of Matthew. It's at the beginning of what is called Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this is what it says once again, or at least the version from Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is not just a laundry list. It's a, it's a, it's a chronicle of the way of being of the people of the church and it helps us set boundaries and establish our structure around which we move forward in this time when we don't know when Jesus will come. We are to be poor in spirit. We are to mourn for losses of friends and other things. Blessed, we are to be meek. We are to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. We are to be merciful. We're to be pure in heart. We're to be the peacemakers. And we're to be the ones who will endure persecution. I'm sometimes amazed as I go through things like last week's convention. We're trying to perfect the world. A wonderful and important goal for the church. But when I read Matthew and I see what we're called to do, it's not so much that we're the triumphant ones, not here, not now. We're the ones who do all the hard work of being truly human, mourning and weeping and peacemaking and taking the risks to tell people that the God of all creation is out there awaiting us and will come for us. And often, and in real truth, most of the world doesn't want to hear this because it would mean we have to change systems and behaviors and all sorts of other things. I love the season of Advent. In addition to the best 
carols in the church. I know, the other ones were really great too, but we don't sing the Advent carols nearly as often. And culture hasn't found them out. They're not really great with anticipation. We have somehow succeeded in moving Christmas to the whole Advent season. Thank you. But it is a time for the church to take stock of where it is and where it's going. It presents us with a tale told from the back end moving toward the beginning. The back end is not only what we hear now, but it's also going to be the proclamations of the prophets and the gospel and, and John the baptizer. And then finally, how we interact with people like Joseph and Mary who are the humble and meek, the lowly, the weepers, the mourners, and the ones who, in their way, proclaim the presence of God's kingdom within their midst. I am always hopeful for the church. Yes, we are easily distracted. Yes, we forget what our true purpose is. But we have the structures, at least in the Episcopal Church, to bring us back into line with what those all are. Today, we find out that Jesus couldn't tell us with any precision when and where God would be available to us. What he did tell us was we could be alert. We could be awake. We could be like the householder who really protected himself from the invasion of the thief by being able to listen even in his sleep, or to stay up, to be present for those moments. As we, pro as we progress through the Gospel of Matthew, I want you to be alert and awake for the times and places where Matthew tells us Jesus is available to us in the here and now. His Gospel is rich with those moments. And it's rich with that invitation to us that even as we prepare for the incarnation, we can also prepare for the presence of Christ in our life through the Holy Spirit. We gather at this time of year, now a hearty few, to proclaim to the world, we're about our business. We're grinding the wheat. We're in the field harvesting. We are proclaiming God and loving our neighbors. <clears throat> Stay awake and be alert. The Nicene Creed begins on page 358. We believe in one Lord, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God, true God, begotten, not made, being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Justin, Michael, Susan, Ted and John, bishops. For Mark, bishop-elect. For all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For the Holy Church of God, especially for the Anglican Communion, the Episcopal Church, the Diocese of Virginia, the Diocese of Ezo, and the coming consecration of our Bishop Mark. For the nations and people of Afghanistan, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, South Sudan, the Tigrayan rebels of Ethiopia, Uganda, and Ukraine. For the victims of the shooting at the Chesapeake Walmart, and for the families and friends who mourn for them. For those who have been commended to St. Francis for prayer, Bruce, Joan, Philip, Mary and Dan, Vicki, Harlan and Lois, Rachel, Bill, Nancy, Michael and Aaron, Dirk, Kathy and Tim, Clarence, Lucy, Janet, Steve and Karen, Cindy, Rick, Martha, Kathy and Steve, and Laura. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Good morning again, and welcome to St. Francis Church. It is lovely to see everybody here. And at this time, I call liturgical halftime. We ask people if there are any birthdays or anniversaries for which we should pray. <laughs> and is this Jennifer's birthday too? Oh, wow. So we have Laura and Jennifer, and it's birthday time. So let's say a birthday prayer for them. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants, Jennifer and Laura, as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Many happy returns of the day. Thank you. Many happy returns. This is uh, when we prepare for communion. Uh, there are instructions in your order of service, and there will be uh, chalices at both corners of the uh, chancel area. And we will now let Larry and the choir give us something to meditate on, and I also invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
I invite the people to stand for the great thanksgiving for Eucharistic Prayer B, which begins on page 367. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread 
and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with blessed Francis of Assisi and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
I invite the people to stand for the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, you have given us to do, to love and serve you with witnesses Christ our Lord. To give to you and to the Holy Spirit the honor and glory throughout all of Amen. May the Son of Righteousness shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you forever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 57.
show him peace to love and serve the Lord. Precision hymnal closing.